Hey guys, this is Careless Classics. I post here on Define Caroline every Wednesday and Friday, so subscribe if you want. Got that out of the way. Today I'm talking about The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. Now let me just preface this by saying I know nothing about the proper pronunciation of Russian names, so I'm sorry. So The Brothers Karamazov is about this really dysfunctional family. The whole thing kind of feels like an episode of Jerry Springer, but like on crazy Russian steroids. So let's talk characters, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about Russian names because I think for an English reader they can be a little confusing. So there are informal nicknames for Russian names, but sometimes it seems like they don't really go together, like it doesn't make sense to us. I mean, we expect a nickname to be like a shortening, like Dan for Daniel or Ben for Benjamin. But that's not really how it works for Russian names, and I don't really know why that's different. My theory that I've just come up with in my head is that I think the informal nicknames are like softer somehow, like Alexei and Alyosha is the informal nickname. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Also, some Russian names have multiple nicknames, which I didn't find as difficult in this one, but um, Anna Karenina, I have... What was I saying? When I read Anna Karenina, that confused me a lot because they used a lot of different nicknames. It's just useful to be aware of how names work if you're going to read a Russian novel. Okay, so first we'll get into the Karamazov family. The father, who is eventually killed, is Theodore. It feels like I'm saying it wrong. So essentially, Theodore is a total jerk. He's really impulsive, he has like no sense of dignity or tact, he's basically hated everywhere he goes. All he seems to care about is collecting wealth. So Fyodor has four sons. The first was from his first marriage, Dmitri. Some nicknames that you might come across for Dmitri are Mitya and Mitka. Now, Dmitri is not necessarily a bad person. He seems okay at heart, but he has inherited a lot of the passionate impulsiveness of his father. I mean, he's really reckless and temperamental, and he does a lot of things he should not do. But then he also feels really guilty about them afterwards. Theodore's next son is from his second marriage. His name is Ivan, who can also go by Vanya or Vanka. So Ivan is an intellectual, and a lot of times that kind of hurts him because he thinks too much. Like, he really struggles between faith and doubt, which is one of the main themes in this book, and Ivan sort of represents doubt in God's existence and all that. Theodore's third son, also from his second marriage, is Alexei. So a nickname for Alexei is Alyosha, and he almost always goes by Alyosha. So Alyosha is like the hero of this story, he's the main guy. He's gentle and wise and loving and forgiving. He's really the moral center of the book. So where Ivan is the doubt, Alyosha represents faith. So at the start of the book, Alyosha is living with and studying under Zosima, who is an elder in the local monastery. And he really loves and admires Azima and like learns a lot of lessons about God and forgiveness from him. Now, Fyodor's last son is illegitimate. Fyodor's last son is Smirdyakov. Smirdyakov is actually a bastard, but you probably shouldn't have that much pity on him for that. This guy is no Jon Snow. Essentially, there was this kind of mad woman who used to roam the streets named Liza Veda. So the implication is that Fyodor rapes this poor mad woman, and then some servants of Fyodor, when they find out that this girl's pregnant, take her in. Liza Veda dies in childbirth, and then those same servants rave Smirdyakov as if he's their son. 
But the whole town kind of knows what actually happened there. Smiryakov is just kind of creepy. He's got this sort of mean streak about him. He's always kind of on the outskirts watching everybody. And I mean, he's really intelligent. He kind of joins in the conversations with Ivan about all his like intellectual stuff about mortality and all of that. Okay, so now that we know who all the brothers are, let's talk about a couple of girls. So one of the girls in this book is Katarina, or Katya. Originally, she is Dimitri's fiance. They kind of got together in a weird way and they're sort of holding each other in this weird guilt trap, but they're both kind of bound in honor and Dimitri owes her money and it's this whole thing. We find out later on that her and Ivan seem to be in love with each other, but neither of them will act on it. The other woman who's really important in this book is Grushenka. Now Grushenka is actually a nickname for another name, but I can't really remember what the other name is. But that's because she like always goes by Grushenka, which I think has something to do with just her place in society. She's like a fallen woman and all the other women in the town kind of look down on her and stuff. So Grushenka is rumored to be like a whore, but really she's just kind of like trailing all these guys along. She's just this like headstrong, fiery person. She's like a real object of desire in this town. She's really the spark that starts the whole fight between Dmitri and his father, because they're both in love with her. Yeah, I told you, it's very Jerry Springer. As far as her moral character, she's not so great when we first see her. She's kind of just concerned about trying to accumulate some money. She doesn't really know what she wants, and she's kind of playing with Theodore and Dimitri. But then she meets Alyosha, and he is so like kind and forgiving with her that she kind of has a breakthrough, and this kinder side of her starts to show, like they have this sort of special connection. And there are a lot of other characters but it's gonna be difficult to get all of that in one video. It's a thousand page book. I don't like we can't cover all of it. Okay, so at the beginning, Alyosha kind of arranges this dinner with Sozima to try and solve some of the family discord. See, Dimitri and Fyodor have been fighting over money. Dimitri wants to get the rest of his inheritance from his mother, but Fyodor intends to keep it. And Dimitri has this whole thing where he took 3,000 rubles from Katerina and like loaded on a party essentially. He's like desperate to get the money to pay her back. So Alyosha is hoping that Sozima can help with this. And of course that goes about as well as you think it would. They have a big public blow up at the monastery. So now we find out that Fyodor has promised Grushenka 3,000 rubles if she comes to him and just promises to only be his. So then after the dinner, Dimitri sends poor Alyosha to go break off his engagement with Katerina. Then Alyosha goes back to his father's house and witnesses a physical fight between Dimitri and Fyodor. And Dimitri is very violent and is talking about killing his father, which does not look good for him later on, in like the worst few days of Alyosha's life. So Zima dies, and then everybody is very disrespectful after he's gone and it just hurts Alyosha so much because he loved this man so much. I don't know, he seems sort of hopeless for a minute, but then he ends up at Grushenka's house meeting her for the first time and his ability to sort of help her and her sort of having like a spiritual awakening because of him kind of saves Alyosha in that moment. Okay, so now we see that Dimitri is desperately trying to get 3,000 rubles. He's exhausting all of his resources with no success. He's afraid that Grushenko will take the 3,000 rubles to go be with Fyodor. So he goes this night to go find Grushenka, and she is not at home. So being kind of impulsive and reckless, he thinks, oh no, she's gone to my father to accept his money. So Fyodor goes to his father's house. He ends up attacking his father's servants, like hitting him on the head with something. 
Then Dmitri finds out that Grushenka actually ran away with a man she used to love. So then Dmitri shows up at the store and it seems like we've missed something. So Dmitri is covered in blood, which I mean, he did hit that servant and stuff, but also he has like a handful of money. So the assumption here of most people in the town is what happened to the 3,000 rubles his dad's been talking about giving to Grushenka. Well, Dmitri uses part of this money to go to where Grushenka is. He finds her and Grushenka realizes that she loves Dmitri and that Dmitri is the only person she wants to be with. And then the police show up. So it turns out that Theodore has been killed. And so Dmitri, who has by several witness accounts been covered in blood that night and had a bunch of money even though he was known to be running around begging for money all day, seems a little suspicious. Well, we find out that it was actually Smirdyakov who killed Theodore. Smirdyakov tells Ivan this, makes his confession, and then he tells Ivan that it was his fault because Ivan was talking about how the soul is not actually immortal like people think it is, and so right and wrong doesn't matter. So Smirnyakov decided to kill his father. So Ivan feels super guilty about this and actually goes crazy because of it. There's this really interesting little scene where he's like hallucinating this devil in the room with him. So then Smirnyakov kills himself before he can be used as a witness in the trial. So basically, there's nothing to save Dmitri, and he gets found guilty. So basically, the way everything ends is that Katerina is going to take Ivan home to try and nurse him back to health, if she even can do that. And she also arranges for Dmitri to make his escape on the way to Siberia and to run away to America with Grushenka. But it sort of leaves us with these unanswered questions because all we know is that they make these plans. We don't know if it works or not. And also, meanwhile, while this has been going on, Alyosha has made friends with these like little schoolboys and he's like a mentor to them. But Alyosha teaches these kids about love and forgiveness and everything that he learned from Zosima. Which it kind of ends on this sort of nice, pleasant note. I mean, like, Alyosha's faith sort of saves him in a way, because Ivan, who is sort of the doubt, is driven crazy by his doubt, but Alyosha lives to spread his message of love, I guess. So he's really taking on these really big theological themes with everything with faith and doubt. He also talks a lot about this idea of, like, moral responsibility, like, our sins are everyone's sins. So like everyone's connected and we're not just responsible for ourselves while we're on this planet, we're responsible for everybody else too. And like I said, the bottom line is Alyosha. I mean, his love, his kindness, his forgiveness of everyone. I mean, he's sort of the model that everybody else should be acting like. Okay, so now of course I'm going to share some quotes that I wrote in my quote notebook. This is a really good one. For human beings were created to be happy, and those who are perfectly happy are entitled to say to themselves, I have carried out God's will on this earth. Of course they suffer, but that still doesn't prevent them from living, and living a real, not an imaginary life, because suffering is life. What joy would there be in life if there were no suffering? Everything would become one endless hymn of thanks to God which would be very holy, but rather dull too. And the last one I will share. For the mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. Okay, that's all I got. Next week I will be talking about Ayawadi on Ayawadi, a cinematic odyssey written by Richard Ayawadi. So check that out. Okay, bye! Like, I just spent an evening doing this. And, like, this isn't even good.